Hello and welcome to Rich Cast, the flagship podcast of mini LED technology. Yeah. That's... If there's one thing the show is actually about, it's displays. It's displays. Yeah. Classic audio <laughs> subject. It's David's favorite subject. <laughs> if you're going to talk displays, yeah. you want to do it in a radio show. That sounds right. Yeah. I'm going to power... make a TV show that's just sound next. It's going to be sick. Yeah. I feel like that, that's that been done <laughs> quite a lot. I also feel like Netflix just greenlit that for me <laughs> just now. Congratulations. Just sound to me. with David just Pierce. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's just you listing sounds you like. I was seeing him like in a little little robe sitting at like a fireplace behind him and be like, and now here's another sound. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. He's with like, like, he's the like NPR voice. Pages. Yeah. He's yeah. like babies laughing. <laughs> I feel like I have to disclose it on the EP of a Netflix show. <laughs> oh, yeah. We got to this right away. You even said your name and you've already disclosed. This is great. That was Neelai. <laughs> I'm Neelai. The Netflix show is called The Future. It's great. You should go watch it. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Uh, this is Alex Kranz. Hey, what's up? Yep. That's all I got. Uh, David David Pierce, host of Just Sounds with David Pierce. It's, it's an honor to be here. <laughs> oh, my God. I love your work. It's Thank good. You. Yeah. You know that um, when you plug a USB device in to, to Windows and it's like, doo doop it's a good one. It's That's tight. episode three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm just offering my, you know, you got a brainstorm. It's a spinoff for the Vergecast. All right, there's actually quite a lot of news this week. Yeah. We've got to talk about what's happening. The iPhone emulators have hit various app stores around the world, which is actually really interesting. Google has reshuffled its Android team, which we should talk about. Meta launched its big AI push to compete with ChatGBT. It is true that Sony announced the next generation of its mini LED TVs. That will be a full hour in the middle of the show today. Mm -hmm. Then we got a couple of lightning rounds, and David's going to do something he calls Headline Blitz with David Pierce. (laughs) (laughs) Speed run. I'm going to, it's the just sounds, but it's me screaming headlines at you (laughs) about TikTok. It's going to be incredible. (laughs) I also, I just want to, I'm going to try to summon some energy in the world. It appears, not today, but there might be a lightning round sponsor in the future. So if you could, everyone listening could just. Send us the good vibes. We're going to make it happen. Yeah. It's a, it's a guy named Steve. Um, he, he gave me 20 bucks. I love Steve. <laughs> Thanks for the 20. It's not Steve. Sorry, Steve. Uh, okay. Let's talk about emulators on the App Store. This is a big deal. So if you've been listening to Verchast, you know uh, your, the Europeans did some regulating, as they want to do. Mm-hmm. They basically said, you have to allow other app stores in Europe on iOS devices. Those other app stores started appearing. One launched this week, Alt Store Pal. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing these alternative app stores want to allow? Game emulators. It's the thing people want. There's been a little bit of back and forth about which emulators are going up first, which ones aren't. Apple responds to this by saying, you know what? We are going to allow emulators in our app store now because we don't want people installing these other app stores. That means emulators have come to the Apple-run iOS app store. The first good one called Delta is out. It's been 10 years in the making, basically. Riley Testout, the developer, has been cranking away on it in various ways, gray area ways for 10 years. (laughs) It's here. People are playing it, and they're loving it. It's good. David, you've been tracking this all very closely. What's what's the vibe? Yeah, I'm just looking to see if this app is still the number one app in the app store. It is, in fact, still the number one app in the app store. So... It was like two weeks ago, as you're hearing this on Friday, I think two weeks to the day since Apple did what it likes to do in these cases, which is just sort of update a support page without really telling anybody. (laughs) But there are people watching these things. Uh, And basically, over the last five days, really, we got the first Apple emulator, which showed up in the App Store and then fairly quickly was revealed to be a clone of the old version of Delta, which was an app called uh, GBA4 iOS, spelled just like it sounds, really <laughs> rolls off the tongue. And it event- it quickly got pulled from the App Store. And then another one came out. I think it was called Bimmy. Uh, it was out for a minute. And then the developer pulled it out of what the developer said was fear, uh, which we should come back to, which I think is fascinating. And then, like you said, Delta came out. Um, we've talked to Riley on this show before. He was on the show last fall talking about emulators. He's been working on this forever. And at one point, a few years ago, thought he was going to be in the App Store, and then that got ripped away and has come up with, I would say, increasingly creative ways, if you want to do some work, to get this thing out. As soon as the announcement came out that 
third-party app stores were going to be allowed. He announced he's been working on one. Like, this was always the plan. And then I think it seems like basically just out of nowhere, Apple was like, yeah, you're cool. You can do this. And he was like, sick. I've been building this for 10 years. Here it is. <laughs> and it is like, I mean, it is a remarkably good app. Uh, for what it does, we can talk about the legality of ROMs and emulation. We should talk about all of that. Uh, I did a decoder episode with Sean Hollister on all of this like two weeks ago. It was very good. But it, it's it's just so funny. This is like a version 10 app that just showed up on the App Store all at once. Like, I think I can say this without getting me or Riley in trouble. This thing has been in test flight for a very long time because there's a lot less mm -hmm. uh, review on test flight. You can just test apps in beta. Some people can have them. I have had it. It's like it's out there. And now all of a sudden he was able to just flip the switch and it is the number one app in the App Store. So much pent up demand for something like this. It's fascinating. So we should talk about the legality of it. Alex, I know you've been tracking a lot of that stuff over mm -hmm. time. There's a war on emulators generally occurring. Yeah, yeah. Nintendo is Nintendo for the longest time was like, you know what, you do you, because the emulator audience I think was fairly small. And I think they have been kind of probably dreading and looking at this moment and knowing it was going to happen at some point. Because you can get them on Android and 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 go to town. But iOS. But it takes some work. Like yeah, it takes some yeah. work. And and iOS is like there's some impact there. And if you can just automatically download this and then get your ROMs, that means you're not going to pay Nintendo for a kind of a similar version of it on your Switch, right? Like, why would you do that when you can just have it on your iPhone? I mean, so the, the answer for the longest time is, and why doesn't Nintendo make a Game Boy Advance emulator and sell ROMs? And the answer to that has been they it, don't want to pay 30% to Apple and Yeah, it's and kind keys. of like, I think the, the, the more accurate, like, like emotionally, their response is, you know that meme of of uh, your beloved? The meme of my beloved. Singer. This singer. Mariah Carey. Mariah Carey. Okay. You know that one of Mariah? <laughs> That's what I think of. The meme of my beloved sounds like a very, very inexpensive Netflix show. <laughs> That's yeah. just a couple guys in an iPhone. And that's one. like a freebie show. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right? That's on freebie. <laughs> <I'm just sorry. laughs> but you know that the Mariah Carey meme where she's like, I don't know her and puts the yeah. glasses down? That's kind of been Nintendo looking at the iPhone for the last <laughs> like last 15 years. Fair enough. Yeah, I don't know her. Go away. But, uh, but, but if you put Nintendo games on the iPhone, you, you just reduce the value of Nintendo's hardware. Right, right. Like right. That's the thing yeah, that has been and the problem. That, that that is the thing. That's that's what Nintendo is most focused on. Is they they they've got a really good business of focusing on the hardware, and they they've opened up. Right. They they've done some more development. Uh, Super Mario is it Super Mario Run? I believe mm -hmm. they've got some some good games on there, and and they've even recently, as like I believe late last year, we're kind of like, yeah, we're gonna start exploring more stuff on iOS. But they, for the longest time, they've not been a fan of it. And they've recently started going after these companies again. The companies in, uh, like, little groups. Yeah. So uh, Jason Citron, the CEO of Discord, is on Dis Decoder next week. Uh, look mm -hmm. out for that. Um, Discord just got uh, what amounts to a cease and desist, like legal orders saying delete these channels, these servers that are hosting emulator groups. And they just wiped them out. Yep. And it's actually, when I mean, we talked about it, you know, he's like, the lawyers won't let me say but basically, he's like, we don't have a choice. And no yeah. one really knows how they ended up in not a choice. So you're just in this weird moment where this stuff has been tolerated because the distribution is zero or a handful of people in test flight who know Riley. Yeah. Um, or illegal in a way that's like fine. There's a lot of arguments that it should be legal, but it's been tolerated. Yeah. Now it's in the store. Like Apple's like, screw it. The last thing we can allow is the rise of successful alternative app stores because there's demand for these emulators. We have to allow it in our store to keep people away from the alternative app stores. And it, it feels like this whole conversation is gonna come to some kind of head. I totally agree. And I think this is sort of a truism of gaming in general that has held true over time, that people who wanna play games 
will jump through a surprising number of hoops in order to play games, right? It's why all of the cutting edge PC hardware is given to gamers first because they're the ones who will pay for it and do the work to adopt it. It's why Apple allowed game streaming for the same reason. People will go out of their way to do whatever they have to do in order to play games. And so Apple has started to pull this stuff back. But I just keep thinking about when we did an episode on emulators on this show last year, Chris Plant, the editor chief of Polygon, basically said when I asked, when are we just going to get Spotify for old video games? Why can't I pay 20 bucks a month to play all of these ROMs perfectly legally? And he just looks me dead in the face and goes, no one actually wants that. And and his point was just that this group of people is so small and so irrelevant to the rest of the gaming industry that it's actually not worth the effort to care about them. For Nintendo, for anybody else, that it's like you leave them alone because odds are they're also buying your new games, and so that's great. You don't want to piss them off, but it's just kind of a live and let live thing because it doesn't mean anything to anybody else. I think the fact that Delta is so successful and the fact that this has become such a big thing is going to be a really interesting moment in that story because this is the first time ever it looks like there is actual honest to God mainstream demand for something like this. Because if you just download Delta, there's nothing there. It's just an app with nothing to do. You have to fill it with stuff. And that stuff has to come from somewhere, and that stuff mostly comes from places that are not you dumping ROMs that are yours from your Game Boy cartridges, which no one knows how to do and no one is going to know how to do. And you can just go on Google and search for ROMs, and they're all right there. So, like, this stuff is just out of the shadows in a way it never has been before. I feel like notable Plex owner Alex Kranz has a response for you, David. I do. It is a lot easier if you want to back up your carts now versus 20 years ago. That's true. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. I think you can technically do it with some of the analog um, consoles, and, and there's a whole bunch of little tools and stuff. And to be clear, Nintendo doesn't care as much about the NES games and the Super Nintendo games. Like when they went after Yuzu, that was because Yuzu was doing much more. Like it was doing the Switch, yeah, the thing actually out right now that you can including buy. Tears of the Kingdom. Like yeah. before, other people were playing Tears of the Kingdom. People on Yuzu were able to play Tears of the Kingdom. And this next part, I say, as someone who owns the Super Nintendo version of the analog, loves a retro game. Have you played a retro game lately? I so I'm watching Fallout, and I was like, I should play Fallout One. And then I looked at it, and I was like, I'm <laughs> not going to play Fallout One. Yeah, okay. it's it's like watching old movies. You, it, it takes a very particular kind of person to be like, yes. You I know where it. they really work though is on the iPhone. Yes, like so, all yes. the games that look like crap on your 60 inch 4K TV look great in a little square on your iPhone. It is the perfect place for this kind of thing. But it's it's it, in some ways, right? But I don't know this. I just know this hypothetically based on yeah, hypothetically you know, the internet totally. and all of the carts that I have legally downloaded. This is um, great. Yeah. I feel like the fact that I am one in in charge of this operation, <laughs> two a fucking copyright lawyer, and three deeply aware of the situation is all bad. Like I'm going to jail when I uh-huh. leave here. Yeah, they're That's actually sitting out there. <laughs> yeah. But just for Neil, I, David yeah. and I get the off. Nintendo police yeah. are here. They're like Nintendo. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't apologize more deeply if I wanted to. Here's the finger whack. <laughs> so let's set aside the legality, right? Because yeah. it, it is actually a weird gray area. There's a lot of parallels to Napster and ripping MP3s, and it's a lot. Yeah. Uh, the law has changed. Maybe we'll come back and do a whole thing on the legality of, of that. Let's set that aside. Mm-hmm. One huge problem Apple has here is it traditionally has not allowed emulation of any kind, and now it is allowing it, which means an entire library of software that people like better than Apple software is available and proving a very important point, right? Like Nintendo games are better than the games that Apple has half-heartedly supported for Mm -hmm. 10 years. Yeah. And they are running in emulation. They're not, they're not coded in Swift. Mm -hmm. The controls are better. They're more portable. It's better. Like the whole thing is showing a vision of what the iPhone could have been the whole time if Apple would just let go. Yep. And I I feel like that's actually the bigger problem for Apple in all of this. Like, the next emulator that comes out is going to just be Windows 95. (laughs) Right? But it can't. That breaks the rules. This is, like, the, the parsing Apple's review guidelines is so funny here because you can just tell the number of meetings they had to make sure what you just said is impossible. Let me just read you two sentences. It says, additionally, retro game console emulator apps 
can offer to download games. So much going on in that sentence. <laughs> the following sentence, you are responsible for all such software offered in your app, including ensuring that such software complies with these guidelines and all applicable laws. Which applicable laws? Who's to say? But the, the, the phrase retro game console emulator apps you, is so specific and so lawyered to absolute death. What is What, what counts as retro? Who's to say Apple can do whatever it wants? What counts as a console? A PC probably doesn't. Like it is so narrowly tailored to just let Apple do whatever it wants and nothing else in the funniest way. I just think this is going to somehow end up with all the Nintendo emulators getting kicked off because Nintendo raises a stink and we're just left with like Atari Lynx. But, but there can't be a universe, by the way, Atari Lynx emulators rule. <laughs> I had California games on my Atari Lynx. That shit was awesome. You had an Atari Lynx? Oh, yeah. I did not notably have a Game Gear. No. I had the other thing. That's a bummer. I'm so sorry. Jeez, I had the ostracized Atari Lynx. You had the one that I could only find at, like, the off-brand toy store. It wasn't great. I really wanted the TV tuner attachment. We'll, we, we're going to come to TV tuners later in the show. <laughs> it's we'll, true. We'll come it's true. back. It's all thematically linked. Um <laughs> just thinking about my Atari Lynx. It had the little cartridges that were like very thin. That was so cute. The Xbox 360 is a retro game console at this point in time. Is it? Yes, of course it is. Maybe. It's two generations ago. It's 20 years old. I think part of this is going to be these companies who are actively selling it, right? Like like Microsoft is pretty active in supporting old games, right? They, mm -hmm. they, they're very backwards compatible. Nintendo is actually pretty backwards compatible. Sony, way less so. So so I think there's a real potential of seeing like a PS1 If you game. are Microsoft. Yeah. You have a 20-year-old console. Mm -hmm. Why aren't you putting that emulator on the store tomorrow well, with the ability to download games for three bucks and you're giving 30, a buck to Apple? Who cares? That is free money. Some consoles are harder to, to emulate than others, right? Like, like the Nintendo consoles, most of them are really easy. N64, yeah. super hard. Even on an iPhone today, it is really hard to get in, uh, N64 games playing properly. And I think Xbox might be the same. I need to double check this. But I'm pretty sure the, the Xbox 360, you don't see as big a robust uh, emulator community around it as you do like Sony games. And part of that is, again, you can just go buy those games. Like if you have an Xbox, any kind of Xbox, you can yeah. just go and play Saints Row 2 or whatever. Yes, yeah, Sony is an interesting example because Sony has done a really good job over the years of making its current consoles, and I confess I don't have a PS5, so I don't know how true this still is now, but for a long time, there were a lot of PS1 and PS2 games that you could play on a PS3 and a PS4. Like They've done a good job of keeping that stuff available and making it part of its cloud services and all this stuff. So I think if I'm Sony... I can sort of see it in both directions where one, it's like, okay, this is helping me sell PlayStation. So I, I want to do that. But on the other hand, I kind of agree that if Sony was just like, hey, for whatever, 10 bucks a month, you can play every PS1 game on your iPhone. Like I'd yeah. sign up for that in a heartbeat. And it's just sitting there for them. It is true that some of this stuff is hard. But have you heard of the staggering power of the A-series chip? <laughs> I, so as you guys were talking, I was looking this up. And apparently there's only really like one emulator for right now for Xbox 360. It's only for PC. It's called Xenia, which love the name. And uh, on Reddit, there is discussions. It, it, people are really weird about it. They're, they're like, yeah, it sucks. Or it's fine. But it's apparently like one of the only ones. No, there's one called Zemu. Oh, there's also Zemu? Zemu is for the Mac. Yeah. How okay. could you forget about Zima? I'm so sorry. I, I, we're, we're all just Googling. We're just anyways. Googling this furiously <laughs> The point right now. is Microsoft is very capable of making the product. Sony yes. is very capable of making the product. It is free to them because they already own the library. Mm -hmm. The demand is obvious. Mm -hmm. And the thing it's just going to prove out is Apple's way of doing things has unnecessarily restricted user experiences That's on the That's a good point, iPhone. yeah. Yep. And I, 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 that is the danger. Because once that falls away and people are like, wait, this is better than when Apple is in tight control of this ecosystem, which is what we hear, by the way. When we talk about antitrust and control, we get an awful lot of notes from people who are like, this is what I'm paying for. It's for Tim Cook to push all the buttons on my phone for me. <laughs> well, and I would point out that one of the really hard things about regulating that is proving the other way because a big part of what like the DOJ in this case is saying is that it would be better if it wasn't like this. And that's so, so, so hard to prove. And this, to your point, is going to be a very real way in which it is going to get a lot better very quickly 
because it changed. And I believe, I don't know, but I believe that's why the emulator rule is global and not just in Europe where Apple is required, like legally required to allow other app stores, which would just go ahead and do this. They know, they can see the outsized demand for emulators. If you allow other app stores with more permissive rules, people will flock to those app stores, they'll get the demand, they'll be like, in Europe we get game emulators. Why don't we get them here? Well, I guess we need rules to allow other app stores in the United States, and they're not. Right. I think they'd rather soon be in a lawsuit with Nintendo yeah. than have any political capital to open up the app model in the United And that'd States. be a wild lawsuit, right? Because a lot of these games were made in a... Copyright was super weird in the 80s around video games, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it remains super weird. It's, I would yeah, say it's, it's, not. It's, not, it's not easily sorted. So this would be a fight for Nintendo regardless. It, well, it depends on who you're suing, what you're suing them for. Like, again, the 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 things that you would map it to are still Napster and Grokster. Yeah. In the Supreme Court, in the appeals courts in those cases, like, invented theories of liability. <laughs> like, with Grokster, it was like, you are enabling copyright infringement. You know it's happening. You're marketing the thing for copyright infringement. Now you are liable for copyright infringement, even though you've done none yourself. Yeah. That's a... It's a bunch of steps down there. You got to get all the way there. Um, I'm not sure that you're going to do that against a single developer. I'm not sure you can prove that case against Apple by allowing these emulators on your store. You know this. You're marketing the iPhone to do this copyright infringement. There's a lot of road. That's a lot of steps. Okay. Yeah. It's also Apple is like the the second sentence of that thing in the guidelines that I read is Apple pretty clearly foisting that responsibility on whoever is shipping the emulator. They're like, yeah. oh, if people use software in here that isn't yours to own, that's your problem. We we told you not to. You've broken our terms of service. Well, that's like, why they pulled the, the one app, too, right? Like the, the was it GBA for iOS? No, that no. is very confusing. Yeah, I agree. So iGBA comes out. That's the first emulator hit any of these stores. Okay, so not GBA. A for right, iOS. but then Riley tweets, hey, this is a fork of GBA for iOS, the thing that I made long ago. That I definitely never had on my phone. Right, and, he, and his life. point was Apple makes all this noise about how the app store is controlled and safe, and here's just a bootleg of my decade-old project that they let slide through while my real project is waiting, is sitting in review. Yeah. So he's like very irritated about this. Apple pulls the app. And then in a classic sort of Apple way, there's no public explanation given of what they're doing. There's nothing we can link to. There's Mac rumors saying Apple has told us on background um, that they've pulled it for these two reasons, one of which is copyright. Yeah. It's so important in this context to remember that Apple's review process is insane. Like, <laughs> like in all seriousness, like anyone who claims that Apple's app review process is consistent and has rules and makes sense is just out of their mind, right? And like, we see this all the time. It's so easy for bad apps to get through while people get their apps hung up on absolute tiny technicalities that don't actually have anything to do with anything. It's it's lunacy. And so I think what happened in this case is once it became obvious that this app was just a rip of Riley's app, it's very popular. This is a new thing. It makes sense from Apple's perspective to say you've violated the rules by borrowing someone else's app. I think there's even the rules borrowed in scare quotes in Apple's guidelines that they can't borrow your work, uh, which is a very <laughs> funny way to say. And so I think in this case, it was it's pretty easy and protected for Apple to say you just boosted somebody else's app. You can't yeah. have this. Well, yeah. And it, it was like it basically had wiped some of the licenses that the original was developed with classic off off of it and classic bad yeah. faith move yeah and like filled it with ads right yeah so it yeah, was just stuff. all around like no this is garbage yeah and, the and guy this is the thing that we see in the app store all the time do you remember the when Flappy Bird came out and all of a sudden there were forty thousand Flappy Birds that yeah. all had a million ads <laughs> or Chat GPT when it came out and was first really popular you could search for Chat GPT and there were a billion things that kind of looked like Chat GPT and were called Chat GPT but just had ads and would like steal your family from you like. Apple is bad at this <laughs> and, <laughs> and just continues to pretend that it is like in a firm hold of everything that happens on the app store. And it just is not. Nope. So that's emulators here in the United States around the world mm -hmm. because Apple knows if it allows emulators in alternative app stores in Europe, people will want them here. It's bad. So it's allowed them here. Wait, can I ask a legal question though? This is the thing I've been wondering about the last couple of days as this has been going on. The This idea that we now see what better looks like 
and that could be bad for Apple. I've been trying to figure out in my head, if I'm Apple, am I more worried about, okay, this sort of proved the point that the iPhone gets better if we allow this one thing, now it becomes more legally dicey. They're going to say, well, now we have to allow all these other things because we've proven the point that it gets better when we do. Or does Apple say, we've thrown you a bone or two, let's all shake hands and move on? Does that make sense? I'm trying to figure out like which is the winning strategy there. I'm going to ask some AI generation program to generate Tim Cook and Jonathan Cantor and Tim Cook saying, we've thrown you a bone or two. <laughs> now let's shake hands. And like it'll blow up. Like we're going to blow up a data center with that prompt. It, it's an unimaginable situation. Okay. Um, I, I think the danger for Apple is they will get forced into allowing more and more things. This has long been the danger. This is why they have fought it for so long. We don't know what kinds of things will happen in the European market because other kinds of app stores are going to let other kinds of things happen. So there's only one app store in Europe right now. It's mm -hmm. by Riley Testout. It is called Alt Store Pal. It's going to launch with Delta, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, and this clipboard manager app, Clip, which is a type of app that is forbidden by Apple in the regular app store because a clipboard manager can see all the things that you are copying and pasting mm -hmm. and Da, 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 da. Totally normal to have clipboard managers on desktop computers. Apple is not allowed it on the phone. So here you go. Here's yeah. this one other kind of thing you can do on the iPhone that you couldn't do before. Is that going to be enough <laughs> to, to turn the tide of regulation around? I don't know. Emulators obviously were. Yeah. Right? So yeah. There, there's only one store right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's only one store. And, and, and there's no porn or gambling. And I feel like we, we made a bet. I think I may have lost a bet somewhere. How quickly porn? Well, I think Riley's been working on this store yeah. for a long time. He, yeah. yeah, and he didn't want to give put it. Porn give on it a it. minute, Kranz. I, I <laughs> absolutely do not believe you have lost this bet yet. Okay, yeah. it's coming. The second the Vision OS app store opens, mm. uh, the oh, floodgates. No. <laughs> Wrong phrase. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, oh, boy. Don't uh, cut any of. So that. There's only one. The, the point is, there's only one store. We don't know. Yeah. But the second there's another compelling thing that you can accomplish with an app from another store that is compelling enough for anyone, any significant set of people to go download that store and get that app, Apple will allow that thing. It, it seems inevitable that that is the, the, just the, how the flow of innovation is going to go now. Uh, you know, we always joke that like just the hint of competition makes these companies behave, just like the, a whisper of competition. Here you have both like mandated competition because of the regulators. There's now other app stores and there's going to be way more than a whisper of competition. There's going to be just people trying stuff because it's a land grab in Europe for iPhone customers again, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. And that pipeline of cool apps come out that Apple doesn't allow to Apple allows it so that people don't go through the hoops of downloading an app. Store. Like what it, what it seems is now obvious, and I'm so curious how far this will go, is that it is more important to Apple to keep you in the App Store than to keep its rules about the App Store. Oh, like, yeah. Like, Apple will bend massively as long as you stay in the App Store. And it's going to be so interesting to see how far that extends. Like, I, I, I am on record with, like, the Apple sports stuff to say that betting and gambling is coming to Apple platforms in a way that people do not yet see. And I think this, like, porn, I think, is probably a pretty bright line for Apple that it it won't cross for a variety of reasons. But, like, there will be popular betting apps that do things that Apple's apps won't let you do. And, like, how far will it go to keep as much in the App Store as it possibly can is going to be a big question over the next year oh, or see, so. see, I, th I think the porn is going to happen as well. I think they're going to the do, App like... Store. Yeah, I think they're going to be, like... Oh, you can age gate it and then use Face ID to access your Pornhub account. And they'll tell a security story about it. Yeah, yeah. They're going to do a whole security story about it. And this then, is No, I disagree. And, okay, yeah. Because you'll just see I, too I will, much porn on the, the subway. No. <laughs> Although, here, two things. One, as I was riding the subway mm -hmm. into work this morning, mm -hmm. a woman was watching a horror movie Ooh. with full speakers, no headphones. Oh, cool. And there was just a lot of deep breathing and then screaming. <laughs> just horror movie. And for a while, it was just deep breathing, so everyone was looking around the subway car. <laughs> Incredible <laughs> breach of subway etiquette all the way around. Uh, and I was like, should I just give her my AirPods? Yeah. Like, this might be worth the 200 bucks right now. Yeah. I honestly believe that if you are listening to something on full speaker, everyone else within earshot is now 
firmly within their right to come over and press pause or rewind. <laughs> or we're all watching this together now. Like yeah. you, you sit have, down next you to have, the person. Yeah, we're all watching this together. And I can be like, oh, can we just go back 10 minutes? I missed the part that was happening. You should be able to sit down next to them and be like, we're watching this together. Just yeah, just do yeah. the double tap to go back 10 seconds. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, don't do that. But if you do, let us know how it goes. Uh, Probably not well. I'm, I'm guessing uh, not well. Okay, that was a side note. Here is why I think Apple won't just like let porn happen. Okay. Uh, I, there was nothing to watch the other night, and I, I did it. I watched Argyle. Uh-huh. Welcome. Which is bad. Which is bad. <laughs> it's real bad. Did his Get hair ever move? Did he ever fix his hair? It's not. I don't want to say anything about this movie. What I want to say <laughs> is throughout the entire period that I was watching Argyle, I was trying to imagine Tim Cook watching Argyle. <laughs> Is that just like if Tim Cook wouldn't do this, it won't appear on the App Store? I, I think that is as good of a content understanding for Apple as anything. And you're like, this is about as far as is he's going to go. Yeah. Like he he had to sit there. And then he had to tell Matthew Vaughn that that was a good movie. Mm. Right? Like they, there, was a, there was obviously a screening. This is a big Apple movie from the twisted mind of Matthew Vaughn. Yeah. Dua Lipa's in the thing. And then they all got up, and the lights came on, and in you know Apple Park, and Tim was like, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. I just there's like a part of me that says like that there's a boundary yeah. on Apple's behavior, and I don't know exactly what it is about the image of Tim Cook watching Argyle that makes me confident the boundary will never get to porn. Yeah. But if you just sit there, I don't watch Argyle. I don't. I can't. Stress this enough. This is not a good use of your time. No, it's awful. It is just not a good use of your time. Uh, but if you watch it and you imagine Tim Cook watching it and being like, this is what I paid for, mm, yeah. then, then there's a part of your brain that's like when the, the whatever Apple product marketing manager comes to him and says, all right, here's how we're going to solve for the porn revenue. Yeah. Like that person will just like get yeeted on site. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> Like he's like my brain can't process this. He's just got a little spring in his office, and he. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful Johnny Ive, yeah. liquid metal. Like it's gorgeous. It looks kind of like the Webby Award. The design is obvious, and it's minimalism. <laughs> but it's just a box on a spring. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's enough talk about Tim Cook and pornography in the same sort of mental space. We're sorry. Uh, are, We're David, you're, I know you're covering it. Are there more app stores in the mix here? I think so. So the the first phase of this, there's been a handful of folks saying it's coming, right? And a lot of it is gaming. Epic has been loudly talking about doing this. Uh, the folks behind the the set app thing, which is like a subscription to a bunch of Mac apps, they've said they're working on some stuff. So I think we're going to get more of these, and there's going to be a set of them that are like very professional and very legit and are sort of big businesses unto themselves. And then there's just going to be this crazy minefield of new ideas. And I think those are going to take a while from what I can tell. It's like, it's hard work to build one of these things. And I think uh, in Riley's case, he's been running alt store for a while. And so there were, there was a bunch of paperwork and stuff to do to get this working. There was the, you have to get like a million dollar line of credit or something to open one of these app stores. Cool. But he was able to, from what I understand, jump through these hoops relatively quickly. If this is just a yeah, because Tim Sweeney was like, "Here's a million dollar line of credit. I need this to start happening." <laughs> Basically, right. And then if you're if you're the the MacPaw folks who have been running set app for a while, or you're Epic, like you have the resources to do this. But if you want to just spin up an app store from nothing, it's actually pretty hard work. Yeah. And so I think that my guess is like this fall and maybe even into next year is when the like truly weird stuff is going to start to happen. But it is going to happen. My question is, what is the next set of emulators? Like, just to stay focused on emulators, maybe Apple's not going to allow Windows. It's Atari Lynx. It's definitely Atari Lynx. But, like, maybe Apple isn't going to allow Windows emulation yeah. in this App Store at the gate. But you can see maybe Alt Store is going to allow Windows 95 emulation. And we're all going to be playing Leisure Suit Larry on our great. iPads, right? Like, you, you, one, yeah. you can see Commodore 64. Emula is the Commodore 64 a retro game console? I don't know. Yes, but I guess. It was, uh, yeah, it was, I believe it, there was one briefly on the store. There you go. I mean, the, oh, yeah, right, what right. is the definition of a retro game console? Right. We could do another half hour on the broadcast, I'm confident. But as that starts to open and the library of acceptable software starts to expand, 
which Apple has never allowed. Mm -hmm. They've wanted everyone to stay inside of their user interface. And for good reason. I don't think these are bad things that Apple wanted. Right? They didn't want a bunch of weird flash ports in the iPhone in the beginning. They, they made very serious rules about how apps should look and feel so that the user experience would be great. I think that the, the time limit on needing to do that has long since expired. So now it's like, what, what else is going to be allowed here? And you can see that emulation of various kinds of other computers are going to very quickly open the door to floods of other cool software, which all, most of which, by the way, won't be monetized by like weird micropayments and ads. Yeah. Because it's just old software. I'm curious. One that I think will be kind of interesting is Scum VM. So Scum, v, Scum VM is a lot of... Oh, what was that game? Monkey Island. Yeah, Monkey Island point-and-click games, all made by LucasArts, yeah. which is now owned by Disney. And, and Scum VM is kind of like independently maintained by other people. And I'm like, oh... That's a really that's one you always see anytime a system starts allowing emulators, the PSP, the the Vita, like uh, uh, even the the Steam Deck. That's one of the first ones you see, and it's like, is it gonna is it gonna pop up soon? Are we gonna get Scum VM? Are we gonna be able to play the Dig and Monkey Island on this thing, or is Disney gonna come around and say, hey? Yeah, we'll just, see. I'm look. I it's gonna be there's wild. a part of me that the thing I'm looking forward to most is some sort of retro Windows or Mac emulator yeah. that just lets me run a non-creative cloud version of Photoshop on an iPad. <laughs> it's like, close. It's that's coming, coming right? It's, it's yeah. coming. Wes Davis, our weekend editor, uh, posted on threads a video of him playing... Um, it was the Kirby, the Canvas Kirby game. Yeah, from, on an for iPad. The DS. Yeah. For the Nintendo DS, but he was playing it with a stylus on an iPad. And it's like, uh, that's better than any idea Apple's had for an iPad game. Yeah, I was like, that's, that's cool <laughs> as hell. I love that. <laughs> that's not great. Um, I'm excited for it all. A little chaos is good for this market. Yeah. All right, I want you all to go. We're going to take a break. You all go just watch the Argyle trailer. Don't do not do that. <laughs> Why would you tell people to do that? Go do anything with your life other than watch the Argyle trailer. <laughs> I've never watched a movie where I've, where I've like openly wished the Apple TV had a 2X button. <laughs> I was just like, because I, I can't stop in the middle. Yeah, you don't, don't just like walk out of the room. Like I'm no, just gonna I, I go gotta, do laundry. I gotta now. know what happened. It's just like a curse. This is why I watch so little stuff. Yeah, because I gotta know, mm. and then I'm like committed, and like now my this is my personality now. Like now I'm a different... I really, David, I think we need to just find the worst content possible and be like, oh, Eli, you're in it now. You got to keep going. Eli, this is a of suits. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to take a break. I'm going to yell at David a little bit. <laughs> we'll be right back. All right, we're back. For me, it was the scene where she started ice skating. <laughs> Wait, who, who? I haven't no, seen it yet. No, this is spoilers. No. <laughs> we cannot do this. <laughs> Listen, sometimes I would say the Verge cast is known for long diversions down strange <laughs> rabbit holes. This is just like objective cruelty to our audience. <laughs> I'm just you know that famous story where Tim Cook looks at his lieutenant and he's like, Why are you still here? Yeah. I literally imagined him standing up in the Steve Jobs Theater when that happened in the movie and being like, Why are you all still here? <laughs> Matthew Ravon just crying, <laughs> running, weeping from the room. Just, it's not good. I have so much to say about how bad this movie is. I all can't. right. That's that's a that's a Tuesday episode. It's, it's <laughs> no, that do that on decoder. Get that out it's of here. It's a full we're gonna get Matthew Vaughn on decoder and be like, all right. So the big reveal how of this movie. How do you make movie, decisions and let's change that? <laughs> <laughs> Whew. All right. All right. Speaking of decoder. Oh. There's an org chart change at Google. Yeah. Okay. That's a that's that See? was a good segue. I love. I pulled that. that one off. I was rehearsing that one. Yeah, I loved that. And I looked in the mirror this morning. I'm like, we're gonna get this right today. <laughs> Just nail it. Uh, <clears throat> um, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. So Google Google's getting a whole reorg. Like, or it's not just Google. It's Android, right? Because David, you you actually spoke with Rick. You, you got the whole the whole thing. Yeah. So the place to start is that Google is a famously well-run company with an org <laughs> structure that makes sense to everyone and uh, is is structured in order to make everyone produce good work. Right? We all agree on that as sort of the premise yeah. of all of this. Yeah. Um, no, Google is just abject chaos all the time. And this is like in large part deliberate. Like the, from the beginning, Google's whole thing has been like hire really good people and just sort of like turn them loose. And it's just like a loose construction of smart people who make things. And that's fine as far as it goes. That's how you get Gmail, which was somebody's 20% project 20 plus years ago now. 
It's also how you get 400,000 messaging apps and all of the weird things that Google has built and killed over the years. But basically the, the thing that I have come to understand over the last couple of days of talking to people, including this new team at Google, which is basically a combination of Google's hardware team, which was run by Rick Osterloh, and its Android team, uh, which was run by Hiroshi Lockheimer. Uh, Hiroshi also ran Chrome, Chrome OS, Google Photos, Google One, and a, a smattering of other stuff. But it basically oversaw like a lot of the most popular platforms where people actually interact with Google stuff. All of that is now being smushed into one team under Rick Osterlo. It's called the Platforms and Devices team. Uh, and the idea very much is to make all of that into one team so that they can run faster with AI. Like the whole story over and over is just AI. We have to do things faster. We have to make our moves more quickly. We have to be able to pivot faster. We have to be able to build new stuff faster. We need to have hardware, software, and AI all together. We need to have full stack everything. Like Google, I think as we've seen over the last, what, 18 months now, got caught sort of off guard by the speed with which AI took over the world. Like Google built so much of this foundational technology and yet didn't beat chat GPT to market. Like that is a failing of that company. And they are now racing to keep up. And I think sort of smushing the hardware and software together, particularly on phones, uh, is a, a pretty huge shift in trying to make that go faster. So I have a number of questions here. Uh, one, I think Google was initially, Alex is just laughing. I'm just laughing. <laughs> I was like, the speed with your, I've got some questions. I just, I, I, yeah. I'm reading this, I mean, it's an org chart. Yeah. I, mm-hmm. I have a number of ideas about this org chart change. But the core one is what you just said, which is Google was caught off guard by ChatGPT as a failing the company. We're, it's, it's been a year now. LLMs are not as good as people said they were going to be. Like right. the humane, pin, like even if you imagine a version of the humane pin where the hardware was perfect and it was fast, it's still like, that's the wrong bridge. Yeah. They, they just, there's no way for them to fix that problem. Mm-hmm. Right. And we have not seen any meaningful improvements on hallucination for any of these models, really. So you're like, yeah, they were caught off guard, and then they were really worried that Google search would go away. Satya Nadella is out there being like, I'm make them dance. I would, it is true that Google started dancing. They, they did a little tippy tap dance. But Satya Nadella didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? It's like, but if that wasn't, Bing has not been the beneficiary of said dancing in any way, shape, or form. Nope. Google, I would say, uh, dancing without rhyme or reason. <laughs> Not a lot of rhythm in the, the dancing happening in Mountain View. Agreed. And so it's like, if, if you believe that that is the thing that set them into action, that's the thing they're talking about. Like, to what end? I don't know, if I'm being completely honest. And I feel like this is the strange moment we've come to in AI. Like, you had Drew Houston on Decoder this week, I think, and he repeated the line that Sundar Pichai and others have said that AI is as important as fire. Like, people just say that unironically, that, that this is the most important thing that has ever happened to society. Like literally that's a thing people say out loud. And uh, <laughs> is it? Like is there any <laughs> actual evidence of that so far? Uh, I mean, I, I would say, yeah. Liz, Liz and fire, I- Fire, Alex, l- yeah. fire. Also I would say there's ample evidence it's not crypto. Like I think, no, I think no, no, we're yeah. there. Yeah, I think, I think Liz and I have talked about this a lot. She gets like weird 2 a.m. texts from me just being like, do you think that like AI is the biggest thing since If the Liz internet? is not responding to these texts with AI generated responses, I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> no, here. she's always fully in the conversation with me. Um, it's really nice that she returns my calls. Thank you, Liz. But I, I do think that like AI is artificial intelligence as a whole, not necessarily just generative AI is a pretty big moment, right? Like, like it is a form of automation that is that is enormous and, and it, it covers a whole lot of different industries. And that kind of big sea change is very rare and it is as big as the internet. It is as big as when we started automating, um, you know, machinery and stuff like that. Like, it's a big moment, but it happens in fits and spurts and, and, and stuff. And right now we're kind of in a moment. It's a technical term. Right, it's only obvious which things qualify in retrospect, right? Like if, you, if you're if you running one of these companies, you look at what the internet did 25 years ago and you look at what 
mobile did 15 years ago and you say, okay, a whole generation of companies died at the hands of these changes and the world changed because of these changes. Like if you believe that AI is the next one, you kind of have to bet everything right now, even before it's ready. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, you'll, you'll get left behind by the companies that do. Uh, That's one side of the bet. The other side of the bet is that at this moment, there is nothing about AI and chatbots and this thing that is that important yet. And, and, and so we're in this place where it's, it's still, I think the, like, we got that incredible pop of like, oh my God, I cannot believe this thing is as good as it is when ChatGPT launched. Mm -hmm. And there has not been a moment that has surpassed that since then. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I, I would be curious to know if there are folks who feel like we've hit higher highs than that in terms of like remarkable achievements in AI. But to me, it feels like we're still riding that one single high. But if you believe that it is going to be as big and fast and powerful as so many of these people do, you don't have a choice but to bet everything on it. Because otherwise, you're just dooming yourself and your company and your employees to death. Yeah. Yeah. And fine. I I think all of the big high point moments in AI since then, or at least the ones that have made the news broadly, like broken into mainstream news, not just this show, um, have been bad. Yeah, they've been failures. Yeah. yeah. They've been they've failures. They've been swaggy popes. Yeah. Like, you know, weird, weird, woke mind virus controversies, like fake ones, like uh-huh. just like all over the place, like Bard just getting dates wrong all over the place. Like, yeah. The thing that is notable about these systems right now is that they don't know anything. Yep. Right. Uh, we're going to talk about Meta's AI launch this week. I generated a bunch of images of stuff and it just like doesn't know how clothes move. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like, and it's like, oh, this isn't that useful. And that's like, so I just want to stay there for one second. Like, you're making this bet because you're like, we have to accelerate our, our AI moment. Mm-hmm. It's still unclear, like, what that moment looks like in the end. And maybe that the whole point is like, move faster, figure out what's right and what's wrong. Uh, Osterlo gave you the example of the Pixel camera. Mm-hmm. Okay, I get it. But they've been doing AI stuff with the Pixel camera. For a long, but this is his example. Yeah. And he's like, we're going to do that, but faster. It, it felt a little to me, and, and David, maybe correct me if I'm wrong. It felt a little like Silicon Valley in particular is very hyped on AI, right? Like like there, the conversation is, what are you doing with AI? If you're not doing something, you're stupid. And a lot of this felt like almost a uh, response to those people being like, yes, we also care about AI. We're at the big, we're, we're big. This is our performative moment to tell you that we genuinely believe in this. But it was really for that audience, not necessarily for the rest. I think that's half right. Like, I think that's exactly right. I think the other audience is investors, right? To yeah. right now, if you want to continue to run the company that you run, you have to tell an AI story. You just do. Like, uh, that's, that is where we are. It's it's what everybody was doing with mobile 10 years ago. It was like, if you didn't have a mobile strategy, what are you doing? Uh, now... That that thing is AI, right? Like it's Mark Zuckerberg is the perfect example of this. Like Mark doesn't talk about the metaverse anymore because <laughs> nobody wants to hear about the metaverse and they sell shares in meta when they do. And so now they're telling an AI story. And in a lot of ways, the AI story and the metaverse story actually run together, but they talk about it differently because that is how you win and you get people excited and you convince them that you are marching towards something huge. So I think you're right. They're, they're telling that sort of same story to two audiences because without them, they don't have the runway and talent they need to get there at all. Okay, so this was but the first question. Okay, sorry. <laughs> is this the right goal? <laughs> yes. Right. So it's just the first one. And I think the answer is probably yes. Like you have it has to be the right answer. Yeah. We have to show movement towards this goal. Mm-hmm. We have to unify Google's famously messy teams, blah, 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 blah. Um, Google now has Google DeepMind, which itself is a merger <laughs> of Google Brain and DeepMind. Mm-hmm. The CEO of that Demis Sasabis, who's been on Decoder, and I asked him, how will this merger work? And he was like, it'll be fine. Recently, some leaked comments suggesting he's not so happy with it. So, right, so now you've got Google Research and DeepMind. Mm -hmm. We'll see how that's going. And then you've got this new group, which, you know, uh, from a thousand yards, if you squint and you're hammered, is like, oh, this is, they're doing an Apple. Yeah. They're doing hardware and software and services all under one roof to make better, complete products. They're going to vertically integrate everything right when the FTC is like, hey, stop <laughs> That's that. That's perfect timing. I mean, you do have to be hammered yeah. to, to make that claim. Like, I don't, 
but you see it, right? It's like right. you squint. You're like, okay, then they'll do all the products over here. They still have a Samsung to deal with. Like if Google's like, now the Pixel rules because we made the software custom for the Pixel. Do you want some of the Samsung? Also, you just announced a bunch of our AI stuff in your phones. How are they going to manage that? Google is very sensitive to this question. Um, I raised this question to Rick and Hiroshi, and the, their response was essentially, no, you're wrong. Everything is fine. The partners <laughs> love us. Don't even worry about it. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but only only just. Uh, <laughs> but I think... I mean, they gave you a quote from the CEO of Qualcomm for yeah. the story, just to be like, see? And it's like, dude, he sells chips to every... Like, he doesn't care. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Christian so, Oman does not care if... Google and Samsung are beefing as long no. as everyone's on phones. Yeah, it's he's, all about the power of Snapdragon. Yeah. I think there, there are <laughs> two things going on here. One, um, I think there's an interesting thing here to compare what Google is doing to actually what Panos Panay did at Microsoft, mm. uh, which is he was running Surface and then he was running Surface and Windows. And the way that they came to see it was actually what we need to do is we need to make the best windows pcs and then give what we make back to the ecosystem so like the surface team actually pioneered a lot of things that really worked well on windows they did a lot of work on the handwriting stuff they did a lot of work on detachables and then essentially gave that back to partners who were then able to make better windows pcs as a result can i tell you a story about that sure i feel like i can tell the story because it doesn't work there anymore okay so one of my favorite cs moments i'm walking around a microsoft booth with panos uh, and we're, we're talking about that exact concept. What, why do you make these things? Because the Surface machines were there and the partner machines were there. And I was like, this has got to be weird for you. And he was like, no, 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 let me show you something. Pound us. Like, no, 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 let me show you something. Yeah. And he's like, that's my hinge. Mm. And he was like, pointing at one of the partner machines. He's like, we, that's our hinge. And that's my displayed blah, blah, blah. Like, he was like, this is all our stuff. And mm. like, what we're doing, like, we're just spending the money to innovate because the e- none of these OEMs can outspend Apple. So this is worth it to us. And I asked him for years to give me that story like in a printable way. But obviously none of the partners are going to be like, that's Panos's hinge. Right. right. <laughs> but I think there's something to that, right? And if you are the company with the resources to feed the ecosystem, you can kind of rising tide lift all boats that situation. And if you're Google and what you need is for AI to win broadly and for Gemini to win specifically, doing that work on the pixel and then giving it to Samsung theoretically works for everybody. Uh, I, I say theoretically because I think Samsung has a long history of not being psyched about Google's situation internally anyway. Tizen, I guess, still exists. Uh, I would not bet Samsung is thrilled with this change at Google, but I, I do buy the theory that if Google manages this correctly, it could it could pull Android AI as a whole along with it. Well, and and you're talking about phones. We've been talking about phones mainly, but it's not just going to be the phones, right? Like it's going to be in the TVs and the watches and all the other places too, where Samsung doesn't have as big a a sharehold, right? Like Samsung TVs, they sell a lot of TVs, mainly to Nilai, but... (laughs) No. (laughs) Tizen, baby. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Oh, that's a good sound. Actually, the Tizen startup sound on the TV. Do-do-do. It's like... Ooh. Uh, just sounds episode, episode five. four. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but but there is all this other stuff, and yeah. and in those cases, like yes, this makes a lot of sense, right? Like okay, let Android me give you TV. the counter example. Okay, let me just before you go off into Android TV because there's nothing I want to talk about more about the raging yeah. success of Android TV. <laughs> it's all you uh, think about. I know. Google bought Motorola mm-hmm. famously. Yeah. In. Andy Rubin, the founder of Android, who worked at Google at that time, was again, is another CS story. He was walking around CS, and he saw how hard Samsung was skinning Android, got furious, locked into a battle with Samsung to bring them back into the fold and ruin Android less. Yeah. Touch whiz. And the deal was Google had to sell Motorola <laughs> to Lenovo. That's what, that was the concession that Samsung extracted to stop it. Like it wasn't because I yelled at them about making bloop bloop sounds and having <laughs> making everyone go to the bathroom because of TouchWiz. It was because Andy Rubin was like, "What are you doing? Yeah. I will sell Motorola and stop competing with you directly if you reel TouchWiz back in." That's a lot, right? And many things have happened since then. We've now it's called One UI. Like it's all different now. 
Google since then bought the failing HTC, turned that into whatever pixels we have now. Like the relationships are different. It seems like the tensions are different. Mm -hmm. But there is actually history of Samsung being so irritated that Google would compete with it head up by buying Motorola that it started peeling people off and Google had to make the big concession. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, TouchWiz sucked. <laughs> like, it was hurting Samsung, wasn't it? I, you know, many people... It was hurting me to look at it, so I just assumed... Uh, famously, someone has called this show and insisted that ladies love the Wiz. <laughs> this is a real thing that has happened on the show before. Hmm. I forgot about that. <laughs> Big Papa Joe, baby. We'll run the clip. <laughs> we'll put the clip in the, in the show notes. That's a real thing that has happened. We've been yeah. doing this show for a very long time. Yes. Uh... I don't know if people like TouchWiz or not. I don't know if that was a good idea. I'm just saying the tension was there. Yeah. And part of the reason Tizen exists is because Samsung wanted its own operating system. It does not want to – it wants to be in control of its future. Right. And it has this massive dependency on Google and phones. And it did not want that in TVs. It did, anywhere else, it, it doesn't want these dependencies. Where I, I'm just saying you look at this and you're like, oh, they're – you know. You do your drunk thousand yard squint yeah. at this org chart change. You're like, oh, they're they're gonna they're walking right back into it. I call that the two a.m. Liz text <laughs> squint. <laughs> yeah, I th I think that's right. I guess I think the, the thing that is different from ten years ago is like, where are you gonna go? Like Samsung knows ties in is not a move at this point. Uh, there's just no there's no option outside of Android if you are a smartphone manufacturer. Samsung. If it made Android worse or tried to go the the AOSP route and build their own apps, like it, it didn't work last time and it super wouldn't work this time. Yeah. And the other side is if you believe that AI is the thing, you need Google more than ever because like Samsung has been way out in front of promoting Gemini. It's getting a lot of these Gemini features ahead of pixels in some cases. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think if, if you believe in the AI revolution, Samsung is actually sort of forced to increase its dependency on Google, not try to get away from it. I mean, what if they end up going with like Harmony OS or whatever Huawei's operating system is on, right? Like yeah, how's that how's that going for for them in the US? <laughs> no, not great, but you know, like I don't know. I I, I think I don't want to just immediately say they're they're totally locked into Android, although they they very much are. I think there is like options available to them especially as we have this i say this in all sincerity make me a list of those options yeah it's it's harmony right os <laughs> they're just gonna go all in on the chinese market this is why you need middleware and super apps <laughs> <laughs> you got us there yeah it was coming inevitably <laughs> yeah all right I, well, i'm excited i'm hopeful for a more focused faster google that's what rick is saying he wants to do. he wants to yep. move everything faster he wants to ship more things i, I think the best thing google could do would to kill even more products actually right now just reduce remember? the number of google products by half and then loudly announce that it will just keep iterating those products for five years that'd be cool that would be a huge change do you remember in like 2011 when larry page came back as ceo and he did i think it was on an investor call uh said the he gave the whole like more wood behind fewer arrows speech and then google promptly killed a whole bunch of stuff that it had been working on uh like this is just the google cycle right they're like the, they realize, oh, we're not making enough money and or the world is changing. The first time it was about Google Plus was like, we're going to reorient <laughs> everything around social, which went super great. And that's why we all use Google Plus now. Uh, it's just the same thing again, right? Like Google sort of lets its company sprawl, lets everything get weird, hires lots of people, builds a million messaging apps. And then at some point you go, oh, this is actually making us interesting, but it's making us slow. And we have to all point in one direction now. And that's what you do when you have to point in one direction. And for Google, that one direction is very much AI. Like they made a couple of other little org changes uh, today as part of this announcement at DeepMind and Google Research and elsewhere. And like Sundar Pichai in particular is very clear that the message is like move faster and move towards AI. Like that is Google's job for the foreseeable future. Will it work? Yes, because Google is a famously well-run company <laughs> with a culture and structure that makes total sense. All right, well, Google I.O. is coming up next month. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And I anticipate we will. I, we end up talking to all of these folks at IO yeah. every year, so uh, we, we'll just see how it's going. We're like one month in. Did it work? <laughs> just stare really hard. And then uh, AI Sundar Pichai will say yes, it did, and then that'll be it. 
All right. I, you know, I, we have Meta is competing with ChatGPT on our list here. Mm-hmm. They are. They announced AI products. It's, they're everywhere. You can chat with a Meta AI on literally any Meta surface you can think of. Mm-hmm. Instagram, WhatsApp, for some reason. Have you done that? Uh, no, I, I have gone directly to meta.ai oh. and only asked it to produce images of Jesus made of spaghetti. Um, <laughs> the true correct use. Yeah. Uh, which it won't do. Hmm. It, it will not produce any religious iconography. If you ask it to produce images of a Middle Eastern man from ancient times made of spaghetti, it will happily do that. Oh. Mm. But it's not Jesus per se. I, you know, you can. It's open to interpretation. You can get to a, a state. You can prompt engineer your way into something that <laughs> I believe. Make it look more Jesusy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the reason I, I mentioned this, uh, just to point out, this has been going on for months now. Uh, crazy AI generated images are constantly going viral on Facebook. Uh, the last one, I think, our friends at Hard Fork covered it. Uh, Jesus as a crab. Just like hundreds of thousands of likes. Was there a shrimp? Uh, cr- there's crab and shrimp. Oh, there's crab no, and also, shrimp. Or, oh, I got deep on. into shrimp Jesus. I totally miss crab Yeah, Jesus. I think hard fork was uh, shrimp Jesus. But there's also, uh, you know, carcinization is like a real phenomenon in evolution where everything turns into a crab. And it has been true of AI-generated <laughs> Jesus as well on these platforms. Okay. And then the one that just killed me, it's a quick post on this. I wrote it. You can put a link to it. Uh, the images of Jesus made of spaghetti on the Lambo also made of oh spaghetti. Oh my god, it was so good. Uh, the last one I saw had thirty six thousand likes. Oh my god, it's very good. Uh, and I, you know, if Meta is going to release AI tools, we got to see if we can just close the loop. Yeah. I, and the the answer is no. Actually, the spaghetti Jesus on a Lambo is not nearly as good as the ones that are currently on Meta's other platforms. <laughs> so whatever tool the spammers are using, uh, a little bit ahead. Of Meta's tools currently. I like that. That's, that's good for them. Meta's yeah, got Meta some work to do. should always be a little bit behind its own users. That feels right. Yeah. Uh, I do think it's interesting, though, that part of this also Meta released Llama 3, which is the new version of its own uh, LLM. And it seems in a very real way like we have a pretty strong sort of four-party race right now between Claude from Anthropic, uh, GPT, whatever, Gemini, and now Llama to be like the model we're in this space where it's like it feels like computer chips from a million years ago when like every subsequent one that comes out every two weeks is like a little bit faster and just the the sort of speed and success is going up really fast but these four companies are all like deep in it they have a ton of money they're very invested and it is it is kind of happening really fast yeah although i don't know that it's quite like computer chips and that they are all bad in different ways Fair. Right. Like as chatbots, uh, Molly White, who uh, writes Web3, is going just great. She just had a newsletter that she's like, I'm kind of interested in this. Like, I, I'm more positive on it than people think, given how she feels about cryptocurrency. We'll link to the newsletter as well. But she's like, I asked it to write this newsletter, and she has all the results of all the four. And she's like, the thing about them is I told it to write like me, and it just is scolding you. Like, they, they write like angry school teachers, oh, wow. I think was her phrase. And it's like, that's the thing. Like, it, they can generate copy. Is there a reliable way for anyone to say whether the copy is generated is getting better or worse, even within a single model, or I mean, as, between as, them? As a critic and an editor, yes, but I don't want to read it all. But so you look at like that. four columns of like middling work, and you're like, I, I'm not gonna rank these. Yeah, they're <laughs> like, all garbage. All of you get D minuses. Like, yeah. get out of here. <laughs> well, in that way, it's actually kind of an interesting parallel to the computer chips thing because we're yeah. in the we're in the phase where they're all passing benchmark tests with increasingly impressive scores that don't mean much to real people yet. Mm -hmm. And the question is like, is anyone actually going to make real use of the sort of raw capability of this stuff that means anything to anybody? Uh, And so far, the answer is largely not really. Yeah. But I do think one interesting piece of the meta puzzle, at least, is it has massive distribution and is 0% afraid of using it. Yeah. Like if you use a meta product, Boy, is there AI next to you now. It's just happening. It's just here it is, just talking to you. Meta's AI showed up in a Facebook group for people with gifted and disabled children, hmm. made up a child it had, and said it was very happy in the New York City public schools. Oh, no. Yeah, that's no, just no. a thing. And someone said, is this Black Mirror? And the AI responded, no, it's not. 
<laughs> it's just me, Meta AI. Yeah, that's a, it was like a story in 404, which we also link many links, links oh, to everyone. Lord. I'm just saying the most notable stuff about this era, and I was like, when it's going a little sideways. Yeah. It's, and, I mean, they've, they've gotten really, really good at making machines that are impressive at confidently lying. Yeah. And that's... The goal. I mean, it's always been the goal. Yeah. Like, just go put a little suit on it and have it run for office. Like, it's got it down. Finally. Yeah. Finally a president I can get behind. Yeah. <laughs> Llama three. It's like, I'm shrimp Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud to be an American. <laughs> that's enough AI talk. Let's talk about the real thing. Mini LED televisions. <laughs> Yeah, we got to TV. It's, it's been heavy, man. Sorry, it, Policy David. updates. There's been European. AI stands for awesome interpolation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Sony, mm -hmm. this is like the most important story of the year. Uh, I'm with you for now. Until next week. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's a revolution in TVs happening. It, you, it, just lock in. All the TV makers are like, <clears throat> Neil, I get it. Yeah. Because I do. Uh, so at CES this last year, we saw a bunch of mini LED televisions. I confidently predicted that mini LEDs would bring prices down and people would start buying bigger TVs. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of data. where There's a little bit of data about some other thing that I'll talk about in a second. Sony has started skipping CES. They've done it for years. They announced their TVs this year. Sony slowly pulling back from OLEDs, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. Uh, so the OLED I have, the A95L. QD OLED, quantum dot OLED, very bright, very colorful. Uh, they're just sticking around. No updates to the flagship OLED in the Sony line. Wow. All of the flagship TVs are mini LED TVs. They're the Bravia 9s. Uh, Sony won't tell you how many backlight zones they have. They will just tell you increasing percentages. Incredible chart. <laughs> they're just like 325% more dimming zones. <laughs> just more. Just more. Don't worry about it. It's just a lot. <laughs> uh, so I've and that's three hundred twenty-five percent more than last year's X ninety-five L, which I've seen, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful TV that only if you're paying attention to do you see any blooming. Now it's brighter. There's three hundred twenty-five percent more zones. I'm anticipating that there will be no blooming, or it will be even harder to see. Which means you can now get gigantic, super bright LED bright TV mm -hmm. with the black levels of OLED. Without the burn-in problems, how much is that cost? And, and it's better for gaming because uh -huh. it's faster refresh of LEDs. Yeah, no, I, I totally am all for that. And with someone with a 2017 OLED, really, you cannot understand how much I'm all for that. Uh, it's also 50 percent brighter than the X95. I'm just telling you. But how much is it? They're not. They're not like a, a number that's good. <laughs> no, Neil, I tell the people. Tell the people. What is the cheapest one of these costs? The the sixty five inch is thirty two ninety nine, which uh -huh. is not out of whack with mm. top end OLEDs. Let's let's, top let's end. just can I just say that can I just say that price number slightly differently? Yeah, it costs three thousand two hundred and ninety nine dollars and ninety. If you're cents. like sitting thirty two ninety nine is like oh thirty three yeah. bucks. That's what a normal TV costs now. No, no, you're gonna no, have no. to stay on the wall for ten years. If you're out there cross shopping an LG G three, you're like oh that's interesting. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. You're going to have it on your wall for two years, and then Neil I. Patel is going to come on the Vergecast in 2025 <laughs> and say, listen, everybody, there's another 325% increase. Well, so here's the problem. So the A95 only goes up to 77 inches, and the top-end Bravia 9s are 85 inches. That's so much TV. Which is $5,499. Oh, I just yeah. bought this TV last September. Like, what am I doing? <laughs> it's a This is bad. Like, I have to send her to college, yeah. right? You know, like... Mm -hmm. That's going to be a couple days of college by the time she's ready to go to college. <laughs> That's like some textbooks. Yeah. yeah. A single textbook. Yeah, you get 24 hours in the storm, kid. <laughs> I bought a new TV. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying, th these TVs represent a huge shift from OLED in this market. Yeah. This is when it's starting to happen, and I, I think that means the rest of the TVs are going to get cheaper. Mm -hmm. Like, these are the crazy top ends that are supposed to compete with the high-end OLEDs. They have insane features. They, um, uh, we've, we're so far from the motion smoothing debate generally, like regular, you know, regular people TVs just have to turn off motion smoothing. At the high end of the market now, the TVs have built-in calibrated modes for the services, where the services can calibrate your TV for whatever they're streaming. So Prime Video calibrated on the, the new Sony Bravia nines 
will know if you're watching a movie or you're watching Monday Night Football and recalibrate the TV for you automatically. But that'll only work if you use, use this, the smart TV function they oh, have. I don't, it's <laughs> gonna be not talk about the details. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to run Bravia Core and stream at 80 megabits per second, you got to use so tight. <laughs> you got you got to make some sacrifices. By the way, there's uh, some debate in the comments of uh, Chris Welch's story about this, about whether it's called Bravia Core or Sony Pictures Core. I'll just, let me just clear it up. It's only a Bravia Core and Bravia TVs, which are the only place the platform supports 80 megabits per second pure stream. Everywhere else, it's Sony Pictures Core, and it doesn't have the one feature that's good. Mm. So Sony Pictures Core is the bad one. Sony yeah. Pictures Core is like, what if we made a not good streaming service with a small cat? Like, what if we made a streaming service where you opened it and it was like, Madam Web is the thing we got. <laughs> <laughs> you just You turn it off. Yeah, I just didn't I didn't redeem my credits for Madam Web. <laughs> no, I will say Sony does a thing that I appreciate, which is they just they make the TV that is just the dope TV. And they're like, whatever it costs, no problem. But like this fifty five hundred dollar one is enormous. It has uh what was it called? Like X wide angle for the viewing angle stuff. It has amazing speakers. It's like I just Sony does the thing that I like where they're like, here is the luxury version and we are just going to slowly make that one cheaper over time. And someday in 2061, I will own this exact TV in my house. And I can't look. I can't. It's going to take a long time. So the, the that's the Bravi 9, the top end. So the flagship Sony TVs this year are mini LEDs and my A95, which we'll just soldier on. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that, that's good, though, because you don't have do you have regret buying it? Do you have the FOMO? I don't want to say at this time. <laughs> uh, then the the one step down, the Bravi 8s, are regular OLEDs, not the QD OLEDs that I have in the A95. They've got all the same stuff, but you can just see Sony is, like, their biggest, best, their push is mini LEDs. I think the rest of the industry will follow them. Um, then there's actually cheaper mini LED TVs. They don't have all of this stuff. Um, I think you use cheaper generously here. <laughs> a very relative term. <laughs> $2,300 for a 65-inch mini LED is like, that is as good as the X95 is dead-on competitive with an OLED, Do with a high-end OLED. I think I need to just one in my house next to my 2017 OLED to see which is better. I gotta like get them next to each other and yeah. see if it's truly better. Alright, so I will end my gushing over Sony's television, which I haven't seen. I don't, know, I don't know if these are as good as I want them to be. I don't know what 325% more dimming zones mean. I don't know if these auto calibrated modes that require to use their weird software that basically tries to like ransom you into enabling Samba interactive TV, which <laughs> watches your every move like a hawk to sell it to <laughs> some snarling data. I, I don't know. All right. That's all just there. I'm just saying picture quality wise, you can see what's happening in this market. Yeah. Next to that is the fucking frame TV, <laughs> which is like dominating the charts. And I just want to tell this story about the rudest text you can sell, send me, the rudest text I've ever received. And I feel comfortable saying this because I posted about it and Casey revealed himself. Yeah. So, you know, Casey and I are friends, as Casey you can tell by the tone of my voice. And so, you know, he just got a new house. He's like, everyone's excited. Everyone's buying stuff. I just got a new house. And he's like, uh, should I buy a frame TV? And he sent me this text at 1230 in the morning. Oh and I, he's on the West Coast, I'm on the East Coast. And I, I, I believe this conversation took another full hour. Like I was like, I can't let this go. Something's wrong in the internet. Yeah, yeah. You, you like you couldn't sleep that night until you get that done. I tried so hard to, to make this man buy an LG. I was like, you play video games. You, you like quality. What? What? Why did he want the frame? Because in the end, <laughs> it was revealed that all of the people he was asking own frame TVs, mm -hmm. including me. Mm. I own two. One's I mean, just in the studio, in the podcast studio in my house. It just shows the decoder logo. That's all it does. Yeah. And it, is, it, it does have a beautiful bezel. It was, uh, yeah, it, yeah, it, it, sure. Sure. I'm trying to help you here, Neil. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm um, saying the frame TV is like a 10-year-old LCD panel with a single backlight, no dimming zones. It's just a bad TV. Yeah. But people like it because this, the display is matte and most people don't actually watch their TVs anymore. They watch TikTok. Neil, like, can I can I float a theory at you that maybe people don't care about three hundred and twenty five percent more dimming zones anymore? Is it is it possible? They don't care about TVs anymore. I think the frame TV is the the harbinger of doom. 
what's the problem? What, what is the thing all streaming services are facing? People are saying, okay, there's going to be a big black rectangle in my house. I want it to look best when it's off because it's mostly off. Wait. I just realized the Sony TV is basically like a cool gaming PC to the, the frames iMac. I've never, I don't think I've ever wanted to melt as much as I currently wish to melt. <laughs> you have so many iMacs in your house, Eli. <laughs> Eli, this is why Just Sounds is going to be a huge hit on Netflix because nobody watches their TV anyway. I it's would... just sound while you look at TikTok. It's yes. going to be incredible. I, I, but I'm saying, like, I think I, I keep making this joke that I could write 10,000 words about the frame TV. It definitely could. Maybe I just need to like rant into a camera for an hour. <laughs> we can edit it together. But yeah. all, all I'm saying is, you look at the market. You look at the the quality of TVs that are coming. Right, there's a technology shift in the TV industry underway right now with these mini LEDs. I think they're going to be really cool. And then you look at what people are spending the money on, like what people think the best TV on the market is. What's still priced? Ex you are worried about these prices. Go look at the frame when it's not on sale. Yeah, it's insane. You're buying a 2016, 2017 vintage, you know, edge lit LCD pan. Like it's bad, and they're charging the prices of an OLED because the display is matte, and you can pay fifty bucks for the art store. Mm -hmm. And people are like, "That's the best TV you can buy." And that's why Samsung uh, will stick with Android. Ties on the phone. Oh, <laughs> on the phone. It all comes back to the phone and Android. Why is that? I just forgot. Because the ties in App Store is <laughs> killing it on the frame. No, this is a bad joke. Keep going. Okay, we'll just cut that part. Anyway, I was <laughs> saying, uh, it's like, just keep ranting about this forever. Forever and ever and ever. I like it, though. I, I'm telling you, the frame TV is the harbinger of doom for the streaming services. Because mm. people are like, oh, we don't watch this thing. We're going to pay a premium. Oh, you're saying because the TV is so crappy that when they do watch it, they'll be like, what's the point? People are buying a TV intentionally to not watch it, is what yes. you're saying. Mm. The point of a TV is no longer to be watched. Right, it's to just be there. It's like a binky. Yeah. <laughs> like, if I need a TV, I'll turn on this thing, and I don't really care what it looks like. The rest of the time, it's going to show me a picture. Is it that many people, though? It is. I would argue the Frame TV is Samsung's most important product. It is a product that has the most impact on the culture today. A thousand words, ten thousand words. I was like, I fifteen thousand. I want to read all of these words. I need. When am I going? I host two podcasts a week. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can't, I, I can't even justify to the to this group of people that we should talk about the frame TV that much. <laughs> Everyone, I need to take a week off. <laughs> I got a lot of emails asking for your ten thousand words on the frame TV. So I yeah. think we're we're gonna have to just do this at some point. Yeah, we're, we'll, right, we'll, we'll carve out. the time out. We'll call, carve the time out. All right, let's do one more TV related. Just to end this segment in okay. a place of hope and optimism. Oh, no. Are we about crans. to go from Neelai's crazy to Kranz is crazy? Yes. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, because one of the things I noticed in the Sony story was that these TVs all have ATSC 3.0 <laughs> yes. tuners in them. Yeah. And uh, this week was the big uh, broadcasting conference in Las Vegas, NAB, and everybody was making lots of announcements. And the big announcement, some of the big announcements I was excited about was from Roxy, who we covered back at CES, and uh, NBC Universal, Peacock, some sort of distantly related cousin of ours. Uh, is that, is <laughs> there's no way. I'm sorry. <laughs> not, there's no way Peacock is a distant. Comcast? Yes. Is, is a part investor in us. Okay. And Peacock. Sure, We're distant sure, cousins. Sure. I don't, mm, mm, mm. we don't know each other. That means I'm basically friends with Zoe Deschanel, so I'm good with that. Basically, that yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. That's the worst disclosure we've ever had. <laughs> I'm basically friends with Zoe Deschanel. <laughs> That's the new disclosure. <laughs> but, but they both announced that they were bringing uh, new technology to ATSC 3.0. Right now, there's a couple of channels in the country that broadcast on this spectrum that, that use ATSC 3.0, not a lot. And right now, if you go and you watch shows on those channels, it's just normal TV. There's no reason to be excited. But coming soon, because of Roxy, you're going to be able to pause and skip in your local news. And then on the Today Show, which I know everyone listening is a huge fan of, <laughs> you'll be able to do the same That's through the good. NBC Universal stuff. And so it's like, it's a little bit, little, little... Yeah, little bit, little little something happening there, and eventually it could be something really cool. I still keep being like, 
one of these days, Peacock is just going to be on NBC. And that'll just be the new NBC. Oh, and they'll distribute over there. I got, yeah. I got you. Monday. Uh, the thing I want to reveal about the story is that when Alex was writing it, she realized that her TV does not have ATSC three point Oh no, <laughs> it does now. <laughs> Get uh, out there, mini I, LEDs I for that everyone. Tuner immediately. You bought a tuner. Bravia nines. All right, we got to take a break. <laughs> I'm killing. I've, I've I've worn David down. This is what you get. This is your fault. My my TCL Roku TV is quaking over here. Oh my god! No, that's just upsetting. Don't say you have a TCL Roku on this podcast. Speaking of TVs that are ruthlessly mining your data, yeah, it's, it's awful. <laughs> All right, we got to take a break. We'll be right back with David Pierce's TikTok headline blitz. Oh god! All right, we're back. I would say that it's when there's not quite enough news is when our show goes the longest. Mm. I don't know why that is, but that has been true for 10 years. I think it's when I give you too much time to mess with the rundown before we start. <laughs> I'm going to start revealing the Vergecast to you four <laughs> minutes before just, we get recorded. Just live reacts. We could just yeah. do a box of me <laughs> reacting to you doing the Vergecast exactly. the whole time. Uh, it's rare that we get a show that's so out of control that we bring up Big Papa Joe. <laughs> Here we are. That's a lot. All right. We're here. We got to we gotta wrap this thing up. We're, we're just way, way over the line. Uh, I promised it, and now it's here. David Pierce's headline blitz. David, take it away. I would like to just briefly catch you up on all of the things that are happening <laughs> with TikTok, because TikTok is not banned. It is still here, uh, and it is wild, is just how I would say <laughs> it. So here's what has gone on in TikTok land just since the last time we did this show together in the studio. TikTok Notes is an app that is coming out. It's only available in a couple of countries, but it's just straight up Instagram. TikTok just did Instagram. And they're like, here, would you like Instagram? TikTok made it. So that's a thing that exists. <laughs> uh, there are also now ways to buy event tickets, like concert tickets and stuff, inside of TikTok because TikTok hasn't found enough ways to sell you stuff. They want to sell you more stuff. I think that is going to work. I think like all of this concert stuff is going to move inside of music apps in really interesting ways. And I think TikTok is going to do it first, and it's going to be really fascinating. There's been a bunch of like non-news news about the TikTok divestment stuff. There's a new bill in the House that is being attached to uh, aid to foreign countries that is partly now also a TikTok ban. So it's possible that that is going to move to the Senate much more quickly where they're going to have to talk about divestment and banning. The president has said that he's going to potentially delay a ban another six months to make this all happen again. Uh, TikTok has said it's going to restrict people who p keep posting problematic stuff on the For You feed. Uh, it also was reported this week that all of this Project Texas stuff, which I would say we have relentlessly made fun of on this show for a long time, uh, is basically just a bunch of nonsense <laughs> and that ByteDance has access to lots of US users' TikTok data. Uh, Twitch and Spotify continue to do their best TikTok impressions. Uh, Spotify is rolling out a remix thing so you can start to play with music in the same way that you can play with sounds and speed them up on TikTok. Twitch is doing a For You feed, basically. I don't know how to say it more than that. They just did a For You feed for Twitch, which I think is actually very smart. The world is TikTok now. Like Everybody is trying to become TikTok and TikTok is trying to become everybody else. And maybe it'll be banned and maybe it won't. And that's all I got. I will say that TikTok trying to sell stuff relentlessly is just reaching new levels of weirdness for me personally. I found a solution. Okay. Okay. Here's what you guys are going to do. You're going to go on TikTok and you're going to search deep talk. One word, deep talk. And then you're going to watch a bunch of those videos. They're going to be really weird. They're going to be nonsensical. You're going to be really confused. You're going to be like, this is just looks like what Kranz's brain looks like on the inside. Yeah, yeah. And you like a few of those, and then you're on deep talk, and you're no longer on shop talk. Okay. It's great. I would When I say all AI right now, it, my experience with it is, like, weird and bad. Yeah. TikTok believes I want to coil things that look like ropes mm. so much. It's like, you're going to buy a garden hose reel. <laughs> you're going to buy an extension cord reel. Mm -hmm. You're going to buy a USB cord reel, which I don't think you should be doing at all. It's just like, have you thought about reels? Buy them. <laughs> Just buy them now. It, it, the, and the, the pitches are increasingly abstract and a little threatening. Yeah. Like, they're like, you will feel guilt if you don't get in on this hose reel deal now. Mine is a puppet. <laughs> it's already bad. It's already bad. <laughs> Skateboarding <laughs> on a leaf over water. 
Yeah. That's all my TikTok is right now. And it's great. I'm like, I don't know what the hell's happening I'm here. just saying there's there are people out there right now who have bought like up, upwards of a dozen hose reels <laughs> because this algorithm has just uh, ruthlessly manipulated them. Yeah. I mean, I did buy something not directly yeah. from TikTok. All right. But they showed me a strainer. I went and got it on Amazon. It's great. We'll see. Do we have a sense of the Senate bill might be moving? Uh, do we have a sense if it's going to happen or not? At the moment, not exactly. But uh, Lauren Feiner just wrote a really good story that the the general assumption is that because it's tied to foreign aid, the Senate is basically going to have no choice but to talk about it. Like where we landed with the last bill is the Senate is just sort of studiously pretending it doesn't exist. Uh, that is going to be less possible now. Uh, and it's it's I think it's going to get raised one way or another. Where it goes seems to be anyone's guess. All right. We, we have time for, I think, two more. You. That was David's Headline Blitz, everyone. Congratulate yeah. David. Please send him a note. If you'd like more Headline Blitz in the future. You can sponsor the Headline Blitz inside of the lightning round if you'd like to. <laughs> it's available for sponsorships at this time. We're still, we're, we're very close. Just everyone close your eyes and send good vibes for our first lightning round sponsor. And then we'll move on to the Headline Blitz. All right, Alex, what you got? Yeah, so Boston Dynamics, they make the, the robots. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, they, they, they make the robots. Earlier this week, they said goodbye to Atlas. And then the very next day, they said hello to new Atlas <laughs> in the most terrifying video of all time. Yeah. Where, like, the legs did, like, some weird 360-degree hinge stuff. The head looks like some sort of lamp. It basically looks like a video game monster. And and then we wrote about how it needs to have hair. <laughs> we, did, we did do that. It was a good pitch from Alex. Yeah. And I said, just make sure it's overreported. And boy, did Eve Pizer overreport the story of why robots need hair. Just Excellent. asking directly some poor scientist, do you think the robot would be less creepy with fur? And the robot's like, no. The scientist was like, not the robot. You don't ask the robot what would make it less creepy. <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> was this written by a robot? Yeah. Give the robots hair, written by a robot. <laughs> 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 That's right. You should watch the video. Our uh, former Verge reporter, James Vincent, I believe his post on the video was, it's funny that Boston Dynamics is leaned directly into terrifying. Yeah. Just oh yeah, horrifying, horrifying. It's thing. very good. Because it looks like a person, but it moves like a horror movie. Yeah. This is probably what the person on the train was watching. All right. Here's mine. I just mm -hmm. want to end with this because uh, I'm just going to say it. So this wait. So this is mine. I just want to end with this. I don't know why I think this is so funny. Uh, Samsung is requiring its executives to come to work for six days a week now to quote inject a sense of crisis. Yeah, they got to get around that Google reorg. Yeah. Wait. So Samsung is like, we want to make this worse <laughs> for everyone. Yeah. So right, they've had disappointing financial results. Sales yeah. are down. Uh, they fell short of expectations in 2023. It's a crisis. We need to make you feel the crisis. The executives are now doing a six-day work week until something. And I, you know, theoretically, I'm an executive at this organization. I feel like if I was like, I'm going to come to work one extra day a week, but it's just executives having ideas about how to not come to work anymore. <laughs> I feel like our staff would be like, you're going to have the worst ideas in the world. Mm -hmm. Have fun by yourself. <laughs> it's like, here's what we need. Everyone have more meetings on yeah. Saturday about how it's a crisis. That's, that's that will mean. solve the crisis. I cannot wait for the weird shit Samsung is about to start doing. Okay. Like just fully. They just did a buy one, get one free TV deal. That's a six-day work week idea. Like fully a six-day work week <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to start giving away toasters when you open a bank. It's going to be incredible. They're going to have the the wobbly guy and the lots outside like, the Best Buy. Is Bixby coming back? Uh, Bixby, full Bixby, yeah. but like goth Bixby. Like get some <laughs> attention. I finally saw the video of what's her name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just crawling out of the water. Just go, go, JoJo. Bixby's doing Bixby. a country album. Let's see if that works. Like, can you imagine what a bunch of executives unconstrained by the reality of making or doing anything yeah. trapped in the office together on Saturday, told it's a crisis and they can't go home on Saturdays until the crisis. Just imagine. It's going to be incredible. I can't wait for what happens this year with Samsung. We're going to get some cool stuff. Every TV is a 3D TV. Like just <laughs> anything. Curved and 3D <laughs> with AI inside. 
It's good. Yeah. And so the whole rest of the world, Drew Houston on Decoder is like, we're going fully remote. There, you don't push your employees. You get better innovation. You can. Samsung's like Saturdays. Yeah. yeah. We're just gonna stand over you and breathe loudly. <laughs> Someone there is is currently pitching bringing back the Galaxy Note, but now it has two styluses, and everybody is like <laughs> freaking out about how exciting it is. Right. Like it's just a mat. Like in the in the lead times on new products are long. Yeah. So like four years from now, we're gonna be like, what on earth? <laughs> yeah, instead of a stylus, it's nunchucks, and it's gonna be epic. <laughs> we're gonna look back on today. Yeah, right. Like, you can directly trace. <laughs> Just boop all the way back to that. It's gonna what be a good time. What if it's a laptop, but it's fifty-four inches? <laughs> all Let's I'm saying go. is, I'm gonna start calling whatever happens next. We just have to start calling it Saturday Samsung. Yeah. Just as a family, can we agree yep. on that? Uh, yes, totally. Okay, yeah. I'm hopeful as a as a as a person who is an aficionado of weird Sony. I am very hopeful for the opportunity Saturday Samsung might bring. Party speakers. Well, right? Where are they? It's coming. Where's that Where's someone Samsung's is gonna answer ask to Saturday. ULT Pro? Somewhere. It's coming. What was that little robot we saw that could Bali? I was just about to say Bali, Bali? is about to get a lot of shine at Saturday <laughs> yeah. Samsung. Bali is a main character. <laughs> Go, Bali, go. All right, that's it. We're way over time. We're just completely over. I apologize, but I don't apologize because the the feedback we get is you'd like this to be six hours long. So we'll do that next week. All right, that's it. That's the Verge Cast. And that's it for the Verge Cast this week. Hey, we'd love to hear from you. Give us a call at 866-VERGE-11. The Verge Cast is a production of The Verge and Vox Media Podcast Network. Our show is produced by Andrew Marino and Liam James. That's it. We'll see you next week.